Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Trev. I'm one of the pastors here at Copper Hills. Uh, So happy to be chosen to speak on the coveted Super Bowl weekend preaching slot. There's actually quite many people here like this. I thought this might be small groups ministry this morning uh, in second service, but you guys are all here. This is, that's so great. Thanks. Like you're going straight to heaven when you die. It's great. Um, Super Bowl. Uh, I should probably say uh, my wife left me last night for California. Oh, California. Uh, with my youngest daughter at the... Uh, you know, it's just kind of a sports week. I'm learning sports is like an important thing in America. I've discovered this. So my daughter got early identification for soccer. She's at the UCLA tryouts right now at 15. Yeah, praise God. She, uh, so we're just going to have one minute of prayer for like scholarship money for her right now. Um, just kidding, but not really. So here's the thing. When Brad told me we're going to do a series uh, called In the Arena. I was so excited. Imagine an entire sermon series on hockey. <laughs> what could be better? You know, um, I thought we could get some of that coyotes here and maybe we could make up, put a little ice rink out in the plaza and teach the kids how to uh, cross check people from behind when the ref's not looking. <laughs> and um, I had all these uh, ideas. And then Brad was like, no, gladiatorial combat in the arena. And I was like, fighting in hockey. He's like, no. The arena of life that can feel like you're in a bit of a gladiatorial combat. That's what we're talking about today. That's where we are, the arena of life. Wondering if God is out there with us in the real world when we leave here today, right? This is the question. I know you've asked us, does this stuff, what we're talking about here in church, does this stuff work on the street for real? Or is this something like we do on Sunday. Does God stay behind here back at the church waiting for us to turn up again next Sunday? I think you probably know the correct answer to that, Uh, but I'm not sure we believe it, do we really? This morning I want to try and make that a bit more real for us. Uh, So let's review review where we're at right now in this series. Here's what we know. Uh, The first thing that we discovered is uh, work is good. That may be a surprise to some of you. We know this because in the opening scene of the first uh, chapter of of the first book of the Bible, it's called the book of Genesis, uh, we see God as a worker, and then actually in the second chapter, we see him resting. I'm going to read from the second chapter. Chapter 1 is this creation account, and then look at this, Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. Here's what it says. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all of his work, and God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all of his work of creation. Okay? Rest, work. Keep that in your mind for a second. And then don't forget that back in chapter 1 of Genesis, this famous verse that you know in in Genesis 1.27, it says, uh, God created human beings in his own image. Okay, so right away, we put those two verses together. What do we know? Uh, That we are created in the image of someone who works and rests. Okay? That's how you're designed. That's how we're all designed. Moreover, right after that, in the next verse uh, in chapter 1, uh, we see that humanity is given work to do. That's what it says in Genesis 1.28. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the mammals that scurry along the ground. So we're going to come back to this verse, but what I want to point out just right now is that it's important where this verse happens. In the biblical narrative, specifically uh, that it happens before Genesis chapter 3. Why? What happens in Genesis chapter 3? The fall, that's right, the fall, and that's where everything goes wrong. Humans go their own way, they divorce themselves from God, uh, and most of the rest of the Bible is trying different ways to sort that out until we get Jesus in the New Testament and things start to get better. Uh, But here's the point. Work exists before the fall. There's work in the garden. This is huge. Think about it. In a perfect world, there's work. Good, satisfying, fruitful work that we can do together. I expect when we get to heaven, there will be work. Let that sink in for a second. Now, if that makes you feel like, ah, you know, I'm two years from retirement. You're telling me there's work in heaven? You're killing me here, Holmes. Uh, 
If that disappoints you, makes you tired, I suggested to you that's probably because of uh, Genesis 3 and how that's affected your work. Here's what happens at the fall. Um, our work, our daily work, gets cursed uh, in the fall. Do you, you know what happens? And the word curse gets used. Look at, let's look at Genesis 3, verses 16 to 19. This is God speaking. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And, the, and to the man he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow, you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. You were made from dust, and to dust you will return. So, the fall of, of, of mankind, the fall the, where the relationship between God and humankind gets broken, isn't just about everyone's feelings getting hurt. Not just about God's feelings getting hurt. This, this, starts, this affects everything. Our interpersonal relationships, it damaged our marriages, it impacted childbirth, and our daily work. The ground gets cursed where we're trying to make a living. So imagine those curses were broken and, and some of those relationships got redeemed. What would that be like? Uh, Jesus can do that and is doing that. Right now we're on a journey of him breaking those curses over our lives and our marriages and in our families and, and in our work. However, here we are after Genesis 3, in this situation. So how are we going to handle it, particularly as it pertains to our everyday work? Brad addresses by asking us two questions. Number one, does your work matter to God? And two, does God matter to your work? And by now, probably you, in the series, you probably know the answer to both of those questions is yes. Yes and yes, but the real question is why? And what does that mean for us? Brad um, continues to remind us the importance of getting back to Why? The why of something that's behind it. So why does our work matter to God? Uh, why does God matter to your work? So today, this morning, I'd like to propose three reasons why and try and answer the why question. Number one, uh, because all work is sacred, not just religious work. And number two, because our daily work is our biggest and best chance to engage with the world. And number three, uh, because it's God's biggest and best chance to disciple us and apprentice us in our day. Okay, let me take you through these. First point, all work is sacred, not just religious work. Who here thinks that pastors and missionaries are just a bit more holy and that the work they do is probably more important because they're doing God stuff all week? Thank you, thank you, thank you. The honest people, the rest of you, liars. Um, who here thinks that God is more interested in the work done here at the church on Sunday than the work you do on Monday morning out on the world, out in the world? Uh, it's a temptation, right? I think it's natural to kind of think that. So uh, it's at this point that I need to show you one verse. Um, I actually already showed it to you, but it's easy to blow right by it, as can happen when you're reading your Bible. This one verse I'm going to uh, put up here is so significant, it has a, a name. Some verses, like pivotal verses, we give them a name, like the Great Commission, the Great Commandment. Like those verses, like we give them a name. This verse I'm going to show you here has a name. Uh, and as I found out, it's on Wikipedia page. So... The verse I'm talking about, of course, is Genesis 1.28. Let's put that up again. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Anyone know the name of this verse? This verse is known as the cultural mandate. Look it up. It's a very interesting little study. And it is a big insight into the purpose of human life. Okay? Uh, and interestingly, it's given to all humans at this point, different than the Great Commission that's going to come later that's given to Christians. In, in being given to Adam and Eve, it's given to all humans at this point. Uh, for this, uh, The cultural mandate for fruitfulness, multiplication, governing the earth, and reigning over it. Now, what's that look like? It's kind of up to us. I should say that the connotation in this verse is less like um, we're the big dog species of the world so we can do what we want with the earth uh, and more like we're the faithful stewards of what God has created and handed to us. Um, you know, at this point in history, it's a bit questionable about how well we're doing with this, uh, but that's a different message. 
this, this thing, the cultural mandate, gets reiterated in Genesis chapter 2 again. So when some things get repeated, like in the Bible, we really pay attention to it. Let's just look at this, Genesis 2, 4 and 5. Here's what it says. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Everybody say, cultivate. cultivate. Right. This verse... What a profound image of how God co-labors with us to accomplish his mission. Works with us, you know, like as opposed to doing it all himself, works with us to do what he's trying to do. Here's the thing. God can send rain, but he doesn't cultivate. Humans can cultivate, but they can't send rain. And so at the, at the point of this verse, nothing's happening because the humans are not cultivating. There's no cultivation. Now, you figure God can do it himself, but he's, he's given us a piece of this to do so that we, we work together to accomplish this. I love that story of the pioneer. Do you know this one who, who came over to America with his family and got some land pioneering? Do you know this story? And he cleared all the trees off of this land and he used them to make a log cabin. And um, he used horses uh, to pull the stumps out of that field and pick the rocks so he could grow some crops in that field. And then he planted an orchard and a garden, and he built some barns, and there's some buildings, and he created this whole fruitful and flourishing farm complex with his family. And then the pastor visited. Pastor visited, and he said, wow, isn't this wonderful what God has done here? You should give all the glory to God. And the farmer was like, yeah, okay, but you should have seen it when he had it on his own. <laughs> Is that funny? All of that can't happen. We can't make plants grow out of the ground. We can't make trees grow. We can't make, like, fruit is a miracle, I think. But you know what? It's not funny how, like, we work together. We, we cultivate. God works with us. It can't, it can't, not, nothing happens without him. But for some reason, he's arranged us so, like, like, things don't happen without us. Doing our job as part of it. Uh, so this, let's talk about this. Uh, how God intentionally partners with us to cultivate the world. Now, to cultivate means to develop something. Um, for example, you know, we use that word, you can, you can cultivate a relationship uh, with someone. And by the word, white way, the word cultivate has the same root as the word culture. Maybe, maybe you've heard of like cultured pearls, intentionally cause, they can intentionally cause the oyster to produce a pearl. Humans are built to cultivate, to create culture. Interestingly, the Hebrew word for cultivate, I did a little word study on this, this was, this was new to me. Uh, the word, Hebrew word for to cultivate uh, means work, labor, or do to expend considerable energy and intensity in a task or function. But almost as much, that word that they're using, which uh, there, which I can't really pronounce, so I'm not going to, uh, also gets translated just as much as worship. Work and worship, using the same word in the scriptures. Isn't that super interesting? Humans are built to create culture and worship. And the Bible's using the same word for it. So interesting. Every one of us here is cultivating the world with our work. Whatever it is, our daily work. Humans are built to create culture and to worship, and the Bible is using the same word. So I propose to you that all work is ministry, and indeed, all work is also worship. Now, granted... There may be some kinds of work that's not. Like, if you're here today and you're an assassin or something, you know, <laughs> I'd love to meet with you in the prayer room after. <laughs> or maybe somewhere public. Let's meet in the coffee shop <laughs> at that. Uh, we'll talk there with lots of people around. Um, but, you know, you get this temptation that, like, you can start to feel, you can leave here now, you can start to feel like your work has nothing to do with this. Nothing to do with God. Like he can, like he can, it's a different thing that's happening out there. And so um, if you get tempted to think like that, uh, I would like you to think of uh, Esther in the Old Testament, in a book in the Bible in the Old Testament before Jesus, book of Esther, really good study. We can't get all into it here, but I mean, think of her job. She's a concubine. What that is, is uh, she's, you know, goes through one year of beauty treatments. She's being groomed as a sexual partner for the king, who's actually married. Right? Part of this harem of women. This is like the Bachelor Bronze Age edition. Um, 
uh, except the bachelor is a king and he's married, uh, but all the women are still vying for his sexual attention. We'll probably get good ratings today. I'm not sure. Uh, a show like this. The point is this. Esther is not doing any kind of religious work at all. It's a concubine. And, and yet she finds herself on the primary plot line of what God's doing. Right then. She actually saves God's people, the people of God. You know, it's this famous, this famous verse, for such a time as this. Maybe you've, you put, you've been put here for this. That, that's, that's a message for all of us. Whatever you're working on right now, here, 21st century America, it might be a moment for such a time as this. You've been put there to do that. The point is, read your Bible and see how many people in there are pastors or priests doing something at a temple, you know, versus warriors, kings, queens, governors, shepherds, farmers, and leaders, concubines out in the world. Interesting. Our work, almost any work, can shape culture and therefore, in some way, redeem some part of the world along kingdom lines. So have you, ever got, have you guys ever seen the seven spheres of culture? The seven spheres of culture. This is, this is very interesting. Here's what happened. In 1975, uh, Bill Bright, who started what? Campus Crusade for Christ. And Lauren Cunningham, who started what? YWAM, Youth with a Mission, largest missions agency in the world. Those two guys meet for the first time in 1975, and here's what the discussion is. The Lord had laid on both of their hearts the same thing. Isn't that interesting? Do you know what he, the Lord had laid on their hearts? In the, in the week running up to the meeting, the Lord laid this on their heart. The seven spheres of culture in a society. These are the seven spheres of culture. Uh, number one, government. Number two, media. Number three, entertainment, like arts and sports. Education, religion, the family, and economics, which sort of included business and science and medicine. So, if you want to cultivate the world, if you want to enculturate the world, this is how it's done. This is the culture-shaping high ground. Uh, if we want to cultivate uh, the world, we have to uh, operate in all these spheres. Okay, here's my point. To shape the world, we have to work in all these spheres, not just the religion one. Okay, let me put on my um, strategy consultant hat for a second here. Here's what I think the strategic error has been a little bit up to now. Uh, the church has said the religion and kind of the family spheres are our territory. And so we have defended that like the Alamo. But we've ceded all this other territory. Kind of let that go. We got taken over by other cultural forces in many cases. Have you witnessed that? I bet you have. At least in government, in education, in media. You ever seen it? Last, I don't know, how old, 10, 20, some of you guys, 30 years. Some of you guys since the 1800s, you've seen the shift. <laughs> um, hear me out. I'm not talking about, with these cultural spheres, I'm not talking about setting up um, a theocracy where the religious leaders run the society. Uh, uh, we, we've seen that. We've seen the fruit of that. Actually, Islam's like that. Notice that? Like the imam, like they're actually, it's running the, the society. Um, and in, it's in everything. Like even I discovered in banking, there's, thing, there's Islamic banking, Sharia banking. This will become important later where I learn about this. Uh, in the Bible, the priests and kings are actually two different kinds of people. So I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying we're going to set up a theocracy where religious people are in charge. What I'm saying is that uh, your work matters to God because we need to operate in all these spheres. And that can't be done by pastors. Where are all the pastors? Here, in the religious sphere. When I go to work on Monday, I got Christians three deep on every side of me. Thank goodness we have the coffee shop in the Center for the Arts. Well, this is the idea. To how are you going to rub up against someone? How are you going to say, hey? Right? This is the idea. This is what we're trying to do. So you got the pastors here, like at the church on Monday. And where are you guys on Monday? Everywhere. Everywhere. Somewhere. That job you have, that place where you went, probably for a reason. For such a time as this. Which is my second point. Our daily work is our biggest chance to engage the world. I don't know how to tell you this, 
Uh, but most of the people uh, that we're trying to serve and love and reach are not here in church right now. And it's not because of Super Bowl either. They don't, the unchurched, like I know it seems obvious, but the unchurched don't come to church. That's why they call them the unchurched. They're out there. Even worse, you know what the statistics show? Uh, when you become a Christian, in about two years, most of your friends become Christians too. We start to clump together. We really are tribal, aren't we? Birds of a feather, we tend to clump together and gravitate to our own. Even happens at church. Um, it, it, uh, it takes energy to move towards the unfamiliar, doesn't it? It's tricky. We, um, we have an election coming up this year. Uh, I can't vote yet. Um, but I'm like a student of America right now. Like I'm just trying, I'm just watching and learning um, everything I can. People are telling me, buckle up, get ready. Um, I'm just watching and learning and trying to see how everything works. One of the, uh, I would say the single most interesting thing I've seen uh, was a chart uh, of the number in, in all districts and all the states and all of America, the number of landslide elections over the past 30 years. A landslide election is when one side wins huge over the other. It's not close. So it's a landslide for one side or the other, like one of the different political parties. Used to be very few landslides. The number of landslide elections is going up huge. Do you know what that means? People of the same political stripe, political thinking, are actually physically relocating into the same districts and grouping together. Okay? Okay. Uh, the result is you don't have to engage as much with people who have a different political stripe, which may be a, a relief, uh, but there's also a hidden cost in this. We flock together with people who think like us and talk to people who agree with us, and we all agree that we're right and they're wrong. And then they go do the same thing, right? Uh, I'll leave it to you to figure out where that leads. Uh, but here's the, so here's, here's where I'm going with this. Uh, we got some division in our society, or even political division. But at work, you don't have a choice. You have to work with whoever they hired and work that out for long periods of the day. Find a way to connect and live a good life. And uh, if, you know, I know we have a lot of family businesses in our church, and if it's a family business, even worse. I have to work with your family who you also didn't choose. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, there's like eight or ten hours of your work day, I don't know, where you are thrust into the world that's at the center of God's mission and what he's trying to do, what he's trying to shape and how he's trying to redeem it. It's not all just happening in the religion sphere. It's a whole world transformation event. Do you think he is not interested in what is happening with you in those eight to ten hours of your work day? with everyone separating in their personal lives, I think actually it could be that the workplace is now possibly the main arena for mission in the world because it's where, it's such a big surface where we have to interact all that time. There's, there's you know, something, it's a place where something can happen, a huge surface for engagement. It kind of reminds me, like, in the Bible, the version of this would be like Acts chapter 11, which um, the book of Acts comes right after the gospel, so Jesus has ascended to the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit, and uh, the apostles, like his followers, are doing all this, they get persecuted. They go underground. And the persecuted Christians flee. So they flee Jerusalem. Everyone's getting out of Dodge. And uh, they head to Antioch, like up to Syria. What do you think happened when all these Christians, all everything happened in Jerusalem, they get up, into, get up into Syria and, you know, start setting, getting, renting houses and going to the market and doing some work and interacting Guess what happened? Hey, everyone in Syria is like, hey, what, what happened in Jerusalem? Something going on there, right? Yeah, and let me tell you. This is how you can see it happening in the market. There's like some rub time there. And the whole Antioch church breaks out. So big that the apostles had to send someone to figure out, is that legit? We weren't even involved in that. You know, I think they should have named that instead of like Acts, which is really Acts of the Apostles. They should have named it Acts of the Apostles and everybody else doing everything they did virally. Because it actually transcends them. Amazing. Okay. Third point. Our daily work is not just where God can use us to engage the world. It is also where God can engage us. 
this is, our, this is my final point. Our daily work is God's biggest chance to um, teach us, show us, disciple us, and apprentice us, to, apprentice us to himself. That's what being a disciple is. Apprenticing yourself to Jesus. Being with him all day, like an apprentice, seeing how he does things, and in this case, lives life, so that you can do it that way too. And you can live your life that way too. Of course, this is all accomplished by the Holy Spirit, which is the way Jesus can be with all of us all the time, everywhere, and apprenticing us and teaching us how to live life. Uh, do you think God is not interested in being with you and teaching you all of that eight to 10 hours in a day? I promise you he is. I promise you. What would it mean to invite him into that? Think about uh, the amount of time in the week you spend in church versus the time spent at your job. What's the biggest opportunity duty there for God to work with you and teach you about life and shape you and me. Let's talk about me. I feel like I have experienced this in my life. Uh, you know, I was a lead pastor of a church plant and um, when that whole thing crashed and I found myself uh, suddenly out of a job, pastoring and thrust into the marketplace. You know, I end up on, you guys know, on Canadian Wall Street in my bad pastor suit lost, like, what just happened? Where, and where is God in this? I felt like I put all my chips on the God square and the big Vegas scooper came and took them all. And now I'm, I'm like into this, uh, three hours commuting a day, hour and a half into the city, hour and a half out, car, train, on foot, grinding it out. And so I'm walking around there, downtown. Here's the thing, uh, a decade before this, I'd actually left my job at a large professional services firm, a large, probably I'm going to say the largest private professional services firm in the world, big American firm. I'd left it to become the associate pastor uh, of our church, which eventually resulted in them, which went good, and they uh, sent me to Amy and I to church plant, uh, which happened, which ended up, and now, and then here I was back out of a job, okay? So that big firm was there. Their big building right there on Canadian Wall Street. And so the guys of my vintage uh, are now like senior partners and they spot me downtown. And they're like, hey, we thought you left to become a minister. Are you back now? I'm like, yeah, I'm back, you know. I'm just trying to, I got to pay my mortgage. Like, I'm just in this situation. Yeah, I'm back. So they say, hey, this is great. We're trying to grow the practice. We can't even find the people. Would, would, you, would you want to come back in? You know, keep your, as a subcontractor. So I do this. In a strange twist of fate, uh, my life had become a complete circle of 10 years. And so 10 years later, I'm right back where I started in the same firm, but at a lower level. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Like. <laughs> Consider it pure joy. Oh, yes. You know, there's the mail room, and then there's me. It's awkward, like in the coffee room. I was actually selected for global career development with that firm, and uh, they put me and dropped me to London, England, and so I, like, I meet the guy who was like my equivalent in Brussels at the time, was like running the whole country practice. I'd see him in the coffee room, and he'd say, how's it going? And I'd be like, awesome. Do you need your mail? I picked it up on my way by to... This is doing something good in me though, right? I'm getting shaped by it. See, so something's happening to me. I'm getting discipled in this. Getting humble, brought low. It was very humbling. This is good. This is very good for me. It doesn't feel good. No one asks for this stuff, right? But I got to make a living now here too. This is my first point. All work is sacred. Banking. I'm Now I'm like in banking. I'm trying to figure out financial services because I'm like trying to survive. Banking. No one likes Banking. Everyone hates banks, sick fees, like, you know. Uh, so I said, you know, I, there's this like risk of despair setting in on you. Um, and then I read this in Dallas Willard's The Divine Conspiracy. This is Dallas Willard speaking. Uh, the specific work to be done, whether it is making axe handles or tacos, selling automobiles or teaching kindergarten, investment banking or political office, evangelizing or running a Christian education program, performing in the arts or teaching English as a second language is of central interest to God. He wants it well done. It is work that should be done, and it should be done as Jesus himself would do it. 
Nothing can substitute for that, in my opinion, at least, as long as one is on the job, all peculiarly religious activities should take second place to doing the job in sweat, intelligence, and the power of God. I love that. This is our devotion to God. Our intention with our jobs should be the highest possible good in its every aspect. And we should pursue that with conscious expectation of a constant energizing and direction from God. Although we must never allow our job to become our life, we should, within reasonable limits, routinely sacrifice our comfort and pleasure for the quality of our work, whether it be axe handles, tacos, or the proficiency of the student we are teaching. And yes, this results in great benefit for those who utilize our services, but our mind is not obsessed with them and certainly not with having appreciation from them. We do the job well because that's what Jesus would like and we admire and love him. It is what he would do. We do our work with soul to the Lord, not to men. That's Colossians 3, 23. It is the Lord Christ you serve, verse 25. As his apprentices, we are personally interacting with him as we do our job and it is as and he is with us, as he promised, to teach us how to do it best. Apprenticing ourselves to Jesus. The work itself matters. So I gave myself to that. I started to learn that. Actually, some good things started to happen. I started to develop a skill. I started to be able to help other people. And then something else happened. Like uh, People actually uh, find out you're a pastor, used to be a pastor. Um, you don't have to like tell too many people that. You can like tell two people and then the rumor mill takes care of the rest in that. And then people are curious, like, what did you, how come you're not doing that now? Like, what'd you do? <laughs> right? Which I didn't do anything, but you don't, I didn't want to explain that. But here's the thing, they find that out and then now they're just watching you to see what you're like. So I was going to be there. So here's an interesting moment for me. You know, I'm working for this young guy. I'm working for the guy who had, he's in the job that I had 10 years ago. He's younger than me. Um, I possibly, you know, know more about this. And he gets, he goes up for partnership at the firm. This is a brutal, this is a weird thing, by the way. When they, to get cut in on the equity of this, they kind of don't want to do that. You have to make the case for yourself and they kind of don't want to do it if you have to. It's nothing like Hugh Jackman and Zac Efron in The Greatest Showman where they, right here, right now, I put the offer down. Yeah. Like... <laughs> There's basically no singing and dancing in it, from what I could tell. Uh, getting admitted to uh, partnership, okay? So um, this guy's really in, in the grind, this young guy, and um, he's starting to give up on the process. He's like, I'm not even going to go for partnership. I, I forget it, man. I'm just going to, and I'm like, dude, you are a great consultant. You should do this. And I, I said to him, hey, can I write your story? He had to present nationally in six weeks, like six PowerPoint slides to persuade them to cut him in on the action. He's like, okay. And it was a bit of a weird thing because I'm not going to get paid for that. Where I was paid hourly because I'm a subcontractor. I said, okay, here's the deal. What night's good? Thursday night's okay. Thursday night's, here's the deal. You're going to buy us food. <laughs> and we're going to stay late and we're going to hammer this out, your story. And so we start working together, you know, after everybody goes home on his story, and he didn't, I'd be honest with you, he's bright guy, he didn't really need me. He, but he needs someone to lock arms with him and say, we're gonna do this. And he kinda needed a sparring partner because he's about to run the gauntlet to ask him like the hard questions. And so we built this whole thing, and uh, the big day comes. You know, big presentation in the boardroom, and you see like the doors closed and like, what's gonna happen? He came out, he came to me first. They made me a partner. Thank you. You know that thing like preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary? People, you know, let a few people know you're a Christian, what your motives are, and then like just doing some weird, unusual serving and helping other people be successful. They had a big party for him. The firm had a big party at a, at a nice restaurant. Everybody was there to celebrate him. And they uh, asked me to speak. So now I have a voice. And they're like, who is this guy? He's like, is, this, is that the subcontractor from beside the mailroom? <laughs> what, why is he? Uh, he helped Sean become a partner. Oh, he, oh, yeah. Okay. So he helps people. The guy who was a pastor? Oh, okay. I see what that's like. You see what happened there? I was out of the ministry. So 
so I thought. We're all in the ministry. You know this. I'm telling you, there's more than enough ministry to go around. No need to hog it. I'm telling you. So here's the application quickly. Number one, what's God's interest in your work? How is the world being transformed, shaped by what you do? How is the culture being shaped by your work? Which sphere of the culture do you work in? And what do you think God might be doing in that sphere of culture these days? How could you join him in what he's doing? Number two, what do you think God is doing in the lives of the people at your work? How's your situational awareness in the workplace? Can you sense something not going good? She's off. I wonder what's going on in her life right now. He seems mad. I wonder what happened, right? When you're sitting in a meeting, especially boring ones, and you're looking at everyone, are you wondering and asking God, what's he up to in these people's lives? And then wondering how you might be able to join God in what he's already doing. Because I guarantee you, he is already doing something in all of those lives. He's got something he's working with them, how he's looking after them. It's already underway. Figure out what that is and join him. Number three, what is God doing in you through your daily work? How is he using that environment to shape you? Even if it's difficult, even if it's humbling, even if you're back at the same place 10 years later at a lower level. Are you able to have a kind of running dialogue with Jesus in your head as you're working? I recommend you do that in your head, not like out loud, just to keep your job. Are you able to keep a running dialogue with Jesus? Even about mundane stuff? What if Jesus was your work buddy sitting next to you on your team, working on the same stuff you're working on? Asking him about stuff. What would he say? Let's end with this. This idea of God, not just at church, but out and about with us in our everyday lives, working in the lives of everyone we see, working in our lives, teaching us how to live life and cultivate the world as we apprentice, apprentice ourselves to him, I feel like that all comes back to the cross. That very moment, that actual moment, Mark 15, 37. Do you know the moment? Mark 15, 37. Then Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. <sighs> what a moment. Do you know what the next verse after that is? In Mark, Mark 15, 38, and the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two, top to bottom. What an interesting thing. What statement is God trying to make with that? I feel like it's something along the lines of this. You know, God is out. He's on the loose. He is not in the walls and the walls and the walls and the holy of holies, whether that's in a temple or way in the guts of a church or just at the, on the altar of a church service. He is out so funny to me in that Passover week that we're going to remember right now where everybody's coming to the temple to do the religious activities. Where's God? It's Jesus. He's out on the street. Walking. You could have passed him on the street. You could have had an interchange with him at the market because he's out and walking around. And you know what? I feel like he still is. He's out and walking around in our daily work, in our daily lives. He's here with us now, of course, I believe that. But don't doubt for a minute that he's out there with you first thing tomorrow morning when you're going out. And, and dare I say just as much as he is here with us now? He's with us. And he promised always, even to the end of the age. So let's remember that right now together. We're going to celebrate communion. If you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, you are welcome to participate. The hosts are going to pass out the uh, elements. And then you can just reflect. Maybe you want to listen and see what God might be speaking to you about on some of these things. And uh, take that individually whenever you're ready. We're going to use our new offering plates where you're actually going to take hold of the plate, pass it to your neighbor, and then take the elements. I know it's a bit counterintuitive, but that way you can have two hands on the plate. And so, on the night that he was betrayed... Jesus took bread and he gave thanks for it and then he broke it into pieces. And he said, this is my body. Give him for you. Remember me. And in the same way, he took, after dinner, he took a cup of wine and he said, this is a new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Remember me. 
so we're going to remember together right now that incredible death that tore the curtain in two and made all this possible. God on the loose in our lives, in our world, in our work. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, so thankful for your sacrifice, what you did, what you gave, what you opened to us. Lord, we pray right now for our daily work that is our worship. We worship you with our work every day. We remember the people we work with and the interactions that we're going to have with them. Lord, and we invite you to teach us. We make ourselves your students, your apprentices. Show us the way to live and to work the way you lived and worked. We follow you. Come, Lord, in Jesus' name.